CNN, don't rinse after brushing and other tips for better dental health. Brush for two minutes, use an electronic toothbrush. We recommend the Philips Sonic Care. You can get them at Costco. They run a discount every month. That's from me, not from CNN. <laughs> from the article, that's why I'm running, reading it. Spit, don't rinse. This blew my mind. At night, you produce less saliva than during the day. Because of this, your teeth have less protection from saliva and are more vulnerable to acid attacks. That's why it's important to remove food from your teeth before bed so plaque bacteria can't feast overnight. Don't eat or drink anything except for water after brushing at night. This also gives fluoride the longest opportunity to work. Once you brush, don't rinse your mouth with water or mouthwash. You're washing away the fluoride. This can be a difficult habit to break, but can reduce tooth decay by up to 25%. I know. Now I'm stressed out. I am. I, and I keep thinking, man, I just, I did it last night. I read this article and I still, <laughs> I, I just can't. So I guess what, mouthwash before and then brushing our teeth last? I don't know. I, I'm assuming. That's our new routine. Yep. Uh, trigger warning on this next clip. Uh, CBS Local News, doctor shares graphic images to warn against sleeping with contact lenses. Dr. Patrick Vollmer with Avita Eye Clinic in Shelby, North Carolina, says his patient's cornea was eaten away by oh bacteria my God. after leaving her contact lenses in. The green is actually dye, which shows the ulcer bed the doctor says formed in just 36 hours. Wow. It could have uh, led to blindness and will probably leave the woman with residual visual loss, according to Dr. Vollmer. Jeez. <laughs> Just had to throw that in there. Uh, BBC contaminated blood scandal. Martin's story. Public hearings began on Tuesday in public inquiry into contaminated blood scandal in the United Kingdom. Thousands of NHS patients with hemophobia, hemophilia, sorry, hemophilia, and other bleeding disorders are believed to have been infected with HIV and hepatitis viruses through contaminated blood products in the late 1970s and 80s. This is Martin Beard, and this is his story. Martin Beard was 17 when he discovered he had HIV in 1986. For some reason, they don't narrate. He was one of about 5,000 NHS patients given blood products. Contaminated with HIV and hepatitis in the 1970s and 80s. Many were being treated for hemophilia. He was tested for HIV, but not told his status for a year dated 1985 between one hospital and another discussing me and the fact that they knew I was HIV positive but they did not you see that I know that crazy. his HTLV3 antibody positive but is not aware of this and you do not wish to be divulged we do not wish to be divulged to him that's insane not wish me to know between 87 and 97 was a, a, a very, very difficult, dark time because there was no medication, stigma was at a high. Also during that time, my cousin, who also contracted um, HIV through haemophilia, he passed away. Jeez. And um, at his funeral, I remember everybody, I could feel these eyes burning into me, looking at me, thinking, how long has he got? Martin was made to leave work and his local pub's pool team. This is crazy. After colleagues and teammates learned that he was HIV positive. One day the bosses called me in and they said to me, the rest of the workforce are not happy. And they basically said, either I go or they go and I was forced out, and I've never worked since. A public inquiry into the infected blood scandal opened in 2018. The government has apologized to those affected. Damn. This was really interesting. Yeah. Because a lot of people were infected, and it was because of how they did these procedures, because uh, yeah. they were concentrating down plasma to try to get enough of this clotting factor for these people with these bleeding disorders. And in doing that, they mixed together thousands of donations of blood together, concentrated it, and then redistributed it. And in turn, infected many people. Yeah, there's a lot. If you go to the BBC, there's a lot of stories. Yeah. I just like this one a lot because it's very personal and very... Yeah. And it's a reminder, too, that you know, prior to... I think it was prior to 1985, they didn't have an HIV test. 
Um, and then also this goes back to a lot of people are also infected with hepatitis and here in the US too I knew people personally mm. because again there was no test for hep hepatitis C I think until 1965 or so for hepatitis so people that received blood transfusions could have contracted Damn. this so be interesting to see if anything else happens if the, he gets any sort of further compensation but it's rough how can you be compensated for that, though? Yeah, and so many people were affected. Yeah. So, Bloomberg, Philip Morris's heat no burn device is cleared for U.S. sales. The FDA gave the okay to put the device called ICOS on store shelves. We talked about this last episode, healthytalkshow.com slash 1818. The agency hasn't ruled whether the product already sold in dozens of countries can be advertised as less risky than traditional cigarettes. The agency determined that authorizing these products for the U.S. market is appropriate for the protection of public health because, among several key considerations, the products produce fewer or lower levels of some toxins than combustible cigarettes, the FDA said. In just two years, 7.3 million people around the world have abandoned cigarettes and switched to completely to high cost. Today's decision by the FDA makes this opportunity available. To American adult smokers, Philip Morris, chief executive officer, said in a statement, of course he did, ICOS approval for the U.S. had once been mission critical for Atria, which has been looking for ways to diversify as Americans move away from traditional cigarettes. It's still important, but maybe less so after Altria took steps last year to hedge against big tobacco's troubles, taking stakes in popular vaping startup Jewel Labs and Canadian pot company Kronos Group, Inc. Yeah, I'm not convinced. Well, they, they bought marijuana companies. They're yeah. just trying to figure out whatever works and whatever, however they can make money. That's, That's all true. they care about. They, they're claiming that these products are safer. And, yes. and I do not think the research is saying that. No, so. it's not. You know what is safer, I would argue, than these high-cost devices and cigarettes? Cannabis. The new runner's high. <laughs> Some often mixed weed with workouts. The new runner's high examining relationships between cannabis use and exercise behavior in states with legalized Cannabis, published in the journal Frontiers in Public Health, is among the first to explore the complicated intersection between cannabis use and physical activity. While many assume the former impedes the latter, the data suggests otherwise. Senior author Angela Bryant and her colleagues surveyed 600 adult marijuana users in California, Colorado, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, asking, among other questions, if they ever used cannabis within one hour before or four hours after exercise. 82% said yes. I would have said yes, too. A <laughs> follow-up question, 345 co-users, people who use cannabis with exercise, found they were more likely to use it after than before. But 67% said they did both. Among those who co-used, 70% said it increased enjoyment of exercise, 78% said it boosted recovery, and 52% said it heightened motivation. Only 38% said it boosted performance, and in fact, some small previous studies have suggested it may harm it. Notably, those who co-used also got about 43 minutes more exercise per week than those who didn't. The study did not look at which kind of cannabis, edibles, smoked flour, etc., people use alongside the exercise. The authors also note that the survey has limitations. It looked at only people who use cannabis regularly and focus on states where they already have legalized it. So there are limitations. Small study, very small sample size, small batch. Yeah, you know, I, I really think we should do more research on this area. Yes. Robert uh, volunteers. I so. will definitely will have to work out, though. <laughs> huh? I have to work out. I don't know. Maybe you can be in the control group. Oh, okay. Just as long as I have to work out, I'm good. I don't know. We got to design this study and get some volunteers. As long as I don't have to work out. AskHealthyTalkShow.com. Please, AskHealthyTalkShow.com. Thank you so much for watching. For more Healthy Talk Show, please consider subscribing to our podcast over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash subscribe. It's free. Twitter and Instagram, at HealthyTalkShow, drop the W. We record the podcast live Mondays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Love and light.